Um, normally, I present with a colleague, her name is Megan Wilker, and uh, the two of us started a blog in 2007. The uh, blog was a result of something that sort of led to this whole discussion. But if you want to find us, we do a series of podcasts um, and we write occasionally. We're on Twitter. You can find us at uh, Irish Girl and Nylons, geekgirlsguide.com. I like to tell people you can tell how long people have actually been on Twitter by how unprofessional their Twitter handles are. Um, but the Nylons thing. So my name is Nancy Lyons and N Lyons. People see it as nylons, which was innocent in high school. I had no idea that there were as many hose fetishists on the planet as there are. Um, and if you knew me, you'd understand the irony there. <clears throat> so Megan is not here. And that's fine with me. It's actually better this way. It's better for all of you. Um, let me tell you a little bit about why we started this blog. In 2007, we attended the Web 2.0 conference in San Francisco. And, uh, and we were sort of struck by a couple of things. One thing was we, we tweeted inviting other women to join us, women in tech to, to join us for a, a cocktail. Um, and there we were, the two of us, having a cocktail. Uh, and nobody else showed up. So that was disconcerting. But um, we, we attended the whole event. It was really interesting. Um, Mark Zuckerberg was there. He wore flip-flops. Um, and made me feel like I wonder why I ever finished college. Um, but uh, at the end of it, the very last session, um, was, uh, it was a panel of average users. And um, they used the words average users. Uh, and we sat there and we watched four people on a stage. And here we were, a room full of developers and technologists talking to four people on a stage. Um, and a couple of them were, were a couple. They were a married couple, they were in their 50s, um, and they uh, owned a series of spin schools. They owned like a spin school franchise. Um, and they had just discovered the internet. And the woman uh, who was sitting on stage um, in her uh, velour tracksuit um, was talking about how wonderful the internet was for business and how they were able to attract all these people to the classes that they were teaching. And through the course of the discussion, we realized that she believed that the internet was Craigslist. That was the entire internet, and she was perfectly happy with that. And in fact, as people tried to enlighten her throughout the conversation, um, she, she really wasn't interested. Craigslist made a lot of sense to her. It was a series of you know, hyperlinks and some fascinating and some slightly dirty postings here and there, and it was, it was good, good fun. Um, and so Megan and I sat there, and as this woman was revealing her love of Craigslist, the entire audience started to laugh. And after a couple of moments, it got really uncomfortable for the two of us because we realized they were not laughing with her, they were actually laughing at her. And we kind of looked at each other and we thought, you know, there's a conversation that doesn't happen at technology conferences. And it's not about usability. It's not about uh, user experience. It's actually about being nice. And uh, so we started to have these conversations. And ultimately, we wrote a book about uh, a process. Uh, and it, Peach Pit Press published it. It's called Interactive Project Management Pixels, People, and Process. Um, and I know that sounds riveting. Me and that Grisham guy, we go head to head in book sales. Um, but uh, the first half of the book is something that I'm particularly proud of. The first half of the book is all about people. Because at tech conferences, and I've been doing this for 15, 20, almost 20 years. I started doing this right out of college. My day job, I own an agency in Minneapolis. We work for Fortune 500, Fortune 100 companies. We build web apps, we build mobile apps. And now, because of the evolution of the internet and how we work and internet thinking and how it influences business, I actually find myself in meetings that 20 years ago I never ever thought I would be at. 
So while, yes, I come from little Minneapolis and this is the heart of where everything happens, I work with clients like general, I'm not an idiot, I work in a town where Target is based and Cargill is based and General Mills is based. So we have a very strategic reason for being there and we work with all of those clients. And over the last 20 years, I was seven, by the way, when I started, over the last 20 years, what I, what? What I realized was uh, people have a hard time bridging the communication gap that technology creates. And we talk a lot about process, and we talk about code, and we talk about um, you know, best practices and, and um, you know, setting standards, but we don't talk about how people deal with each other. And we don't talk about things like vulnerability. And we don't talk about things like emotional intelligence. So Megan and I started talking about that, and I will tell you this. My little agency of four people has grown exponentially the more we have talked to people like people. Bizarre, I know. So I'm here to like facilitate probably the softest discussion you're going to have in these 24 hours, and I don't care. Because I'm, I feel pretty strongly that when you start to embrace some of the things that we like to discuss and, and when you start to embrace some of the concepts that I'll introduce or remind you of, because you actually probably learned them in kindergarten, um, you'll see yourselves being more successful. So one of the things we talk about is interactive. I think interactive, um, digital, uh, these are words that have sort of gotten muddy over the years. And I want to be really clear about what we're talking about. It's not advertising, although I think advertising has sort of set the stage for what to expect in terms of process and delivery. I mean, we have this old methodology, this old sort of way of thinking about things, and the advertising industry has sort of determined what that looks like. And it's not software either. Um, Software has a, a process all its own, and this is something in the middle. And it's definitely not banner ads, and if you're working with an agency. In fact, let me just check the pulse of this room. Like, who are you people? Are you, <laughs> right? Are you, are you all devs? Are you all, is that, is that what you do? Everybody's a dev in the room. Awesome. That's great. That actually, anybody not a dev? That would be weird, right? OK, cool. That's good. So, <clears throat> so devs, and, I'm, and when I talk to you, understand that I work with your people every day of my life. I get you. You're some of my best friends. Um, and yet, you have a PR problem. And I'm doing this. There's me, and then there's you. Don't feel bad. Um, you have a PR problem. And the PR problem is really around how people think about what you do, whether or not they think about what you do at all. And so let's, let's kind of talk about that. I think, um, you know, 15 years ago, before the web was mainstream, before mobile was such a curiosity in an overhyped platform or series of platforms, it, it actually made a lot of sense to be mystical in what we did. There was a lot of mystery around who we were and how we worked, and there was job security in mysticism. There was. So it paid for those people on the agency side, in the organizational side, leadership to not understand what you do. It was actually a good thing. But now we're in a place where digital is first. It's the front door of every business. They're extending whole businesses to the web and to mobile. And we can't afford to not understand each other. So what's happening? Well, we've got this weird sort of economic situation where because of the state of the economy, because of the state of things today, people are terrified. They're terrified to admit that they don't know something. But they're hiring people like you who speak a language they don't understand and they're sitting at the same table with you and they're trying to communicate requirements to you and they don't know how to say, actually, I have no idea what the hell you do. I don't know, I don't, I don't, and, and I think front end dev is a really interesting thing because it's only been in the last several years that we've really recognized the value and the distinction of front end development. I mean, really, as outsiders, it never really occurred to us before that there was a difference between front end and programming. I mean, it never, we don't, 
we don't get the difference. So the PR problem comes from also this sort of muddy, the muddy waters where people that own businesses or manage businesses, people on client side or people that we work for or that we contract for, they equate a lot of what happens in the technology space with IT. And it's a tragic thing. And I, I'm sure you're seeing it. IT is in a really interesting place because they're trying to be relevant. So it used to be that they were really responsible. Anybody, any IT folks in here? Just checking. OK, good. Phew. Um, IT is really trying to be relevant. That is a discipline that sort of started with the intention of networking environments. But organizations started to lean on it more and more in the hopes that they would actually translate technology. Now IT is a bottleneck inside of organizations. And we see it all the time. I see it all the time. People inside of companies and the marketing group cannot get their websites updated because they're waiting in, on IT. And IT gets to decide what kinds of software is purchased and what kinds of decisions are made about technology in places where they should not be. Am I wrong? Do you guys see that? I see it all the time. And unfortunately, because they're as frustrated as they are, marketing folks, the folks that hire us, business people, they sort of lump all technologists into the same bucket, and we suffer from the same PR problem. Between that and sort of that old school mentality of keeping it a little mystical, and, and let's face it, and again, I work with programmers, I work with devs all the time, how social are you guys? I mean, I'm, gonna, I'm using sweeping generalizations and I'm open to that, I'm cool with it, but you might not be. But really, you do what you do because your personality is suited for it too, correct? So when you think about it, they don't know how to talk to you, you're not really interested in talking to them, that creates a bit of a problem, and yet, clients make one big mistake when they come to us for work. They walk in the door, with a solution, not a problem. We're creative thinkers. We are smart individuals. We are really, really valuable when we are members of the team and when we're utilized as the creative thinkers that we are to think through solutions. It almost never happens. We're almost always approached with, well, we need this and do it. And that is probably not the best use of our time. But the last thing they're going to do is, con is, is convince us otherwise, that they don't know what they're doing or they don't know what they're asking for. And we see it all the time. And most of the time when I'm talking about they, I'm talking about client side. And I'm going to assume that you have your own mix of clients, whether they're internal or external, whether you're a contractor, you're working inside of an organization, whatever that is. When I'm talking about they, I'm talking about business people who are making business decisions that are influenced by digital. So one of the things, and this is the reason that we actually got this book contract. So I, we did a keynote, and it was about innovation. We were at an innovation conference, and the acquisitions editor from Peach Pit approached us afterwards because my big thing is we spend a lot of time talking about technology and technology solutions. And I can't tell you the number of times that I've had a client approach me and say, listen, we're really looking for a software that will help us organizationally collaborate better, do knowledge sharing better. We want to figure out how to work together more collaboratively, so can you recommend a software? And I almost always say, actually, the problem isn't with your technology. The problem is culture. It's almost always how you treat people, how you empower people, how you encourage them to work together, the conversations that you try to facilitate. Those are the bigger issues. And I find it fascinating that we believe that software and hardware is really sort of the, the, the heart of innovation. We are. People are. People make innovation happen. People ideate and think of big ideas that we decide to execute. And quite frankly, some of the best ideas I've ever been around have come from people who have no idea how to code. They recognize that there's a business problem, and they're able to articulate it in a way that coders or inventive folks are able to embrace and solve. And I think that's sort of interesting because when I think about, and I've grown up around developers. I grew up on the internet. I work every day with devs. We work very heavily on you know, some very complicated projects. And as I mentioned, 
This is my second company, my first company we started, and all we did was websites. Remember websites? Simple little brochure where, and we were an internet service provider. Now suddenly, we are on the side of the table with PepsiCo, for instance. We work with a new division of PepsiCo, helping them define new product. There is no reason for us to be there. Based on the things that we've grown up doing, there is no reason for us to be there other than we understand internet culture, internet thinking, and how the internet has essentially influenced how we work together and how we talk to each other. So the react, and, and let me tell you a little secret too. Interestingly enough, the reason that PepsiCo chose us to help them on this initiative, and this was 18 months ago, was because Megan and I, two women who spoke plain English, went to a pitch, and we were at a cattle call, and we sat there and watched men in suits filter out of the PepsiCo campus, and then we went in, and we had no idea why we were there, by the way. This is like this big black box project, and it still is. And we were sort of being interviewed, and there were some sort of very vague requirements being shared. But nobody was getting terribly specific. And the reason that we got the business that led to a relatively decent contract uh, was because we spoke plain English. We talked to the two women sitting at the table who were not the IT guy who they brought to translate the conversations they were having. And we made them feel safe enough to acknowledge that they didn't understand what they were being tasked with entirely. And they were really looking for a vendor partner that they could trust and bounce ideas off of. And when they felt safe enough to admit that they didn't know something, they hired us which is a really bizarre, because I mean, think about it. In the pitch process, whether you're trying to get a job, whether you're working with a team and you're trying to sell business, whatever it is, we're trying to impress people. And you never impress people by telling them what you don't know or encouraging them to tell you what they don't know. And yet, approach is everything. And I think you know, the pitch process has sort of gone sideways anyway where you know, we go in and we introduce all of our big thinking when we really know nothing yet. And what we try to encourage people to do is have conversations and remind them that technology is an innovation, people are. So one of the things that I try to remind people all the time, and again, you guys work day in and day out with mostly technologists and business people. So it's hard when these sorts of reminders are as stark as they are, but the reality is technology creates tension still. Everything we're talking about, all the stuff that's happening on the internet, it's all so mainstream and overhyped and everybody reads Wired and everybody reads the Harvard Business Review. So when clients or you know, prospects come to us with ideas, they feel well informed. They feel like they know what they're asking for and you are the last person to tell them otherwise. That comes out later, oftentimes to the detriment of a project. But technology creates tension, and we're all in that boat. You know, there, you can sort of split our culture in two right now. And, and I know where all of you guys sit, but there's the people that, and you know it, you're this person in your family. There's the people that get computers and the people that don't. And I think it's a tragic thing, but it's still a reality that we don't really talk about. And the people that don't are convinced that they never will. And I know this because I do, a lot of com I do a lot of facilitating conversations with leadership groups. And recently, I uh, facilitated a conversation with the, a, a women's leadership network owned by a large global umbrella company. And, uh, and the women in the group, many of them were CEOs of large agencies. And they were overwhelmed by technology. They were completely overwhelmed. They believed that they would never get a handle on it. One of the women was, one, was a CEO of one of the biggest agencies on the planet and very well regarded, very well respected, lovely human being. She didn't know how to send a picture of her son playing basketball on her Blackberry. And somewhere in the course of the evening, she revealed that. So she distances herself from technology decisions because she doesn't want to reveal what she doesn't know. 
And I found it fascinating. This is a wildly powerful human being. And her excuse for not getting it was, it's too much. It's overwhelm. It's like those people that think Twitter is like email, and they have to check every single one, so they just don't go there. And you know, I always tell people, like, technology is like the radio. You know, when you get in your car, you turn it on, you listen to it, and it's great. And it accompanies you on your way to work. And then you get out of your car, and you're not listening to it anymore. You're not thinking, oh my god, I wonder what's happening on the radio. I wonder what I'm missing on the radio. That's not happening. And you know, so I, we use these sort of helpful words and phrases with people so that they get an understanding of, it doesn't have to be overwhelming. It's not rocket science. That's the other thing I try to tell them. It's not rocket science. It's actually something you can embrace. And all you need is a theoretical understanding of how these things work. So you know, in the front end dev space, what we try to do is explain what you're doing, not how you do it what you're doing, and it goes a long way. But technology creates tension by its very nature. People don't like the blue screen. People don't like not understanding what it is you're doing. They don't know what they're paying for half the time. It's not safe to admit that. Leadership can't say, I don't know. So there's all these sort of human behavioral factors that play into confusion around the work that we do, which is why a process is so, so critical. The other thing that I want to impress upon all of you, and how many of you had a pro have had a project go off the rails? Okay, the rest of you are lying. If you're not raising your hand. Um, so uh, I think it's interesting because if I talk to, and I'm, you know, I'm talking about agencies for the most part, but when I talk to the people that we do work for, um, oftentimes they believe that projects fail because of technology. And I think it's easy to scapegoat things you don't understand, but projects don't fail because of technology. They fail because of people. They fail because expectations aren't met. They fail because people believe that they've communicated effectively. They believe that they understand each other when, in fact, they really don't. So I'll give you an example. We did a, um, a very involved uh, web system for a web-based system for a client that uh, has a number of classes that they uh, make available to their, their end user, their customer. And uh, we were dealing with you know, the director of marketing and the director of education for this large organization. And, we just, and one of the things that, one of the features that we defined for them was this new database, because they had, had all of their classes available on a PDF right, whatever, and people would fill out the PDF and then it would get manually, uh, it, it would get manually added to this list of classes. So we decided to replace this archaic system that they had with a, you know, a simple database. So for weeks and weeks and weeks we were talking about the database and the expectations around the database and what we thought we were building for them and we took all the fields from the existing forms that they had and we had conversations that really felt like we understood each other. And when we got to that actual point of delivery, we delivered it to the client, and you could see the look on their face. It was like shock and horror all at once, because what they realized was that databases aren't magical. You still need a person to put information in them so that they can serve that information up to the end user looking for a class. And it was the craziest moment when we realized, this was several years ago, but we realized that we had been talking about something that we believed that we had explained effectively. We, they had signed off on a requirements definition that outlined exactly how this feature was going to function. And there was still a lack of understanding around what exactly we were building for them. So projects fail because people have expectations of how something could, can work, should work. And you know, there's that other piece too, and that is, for whatever reason, a lot of times when people buy the work that we do, they believe that they are solving all of their problems. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a Toyota Camry and a Mercedes Benz. When you get into them, you know where the key goes, right? You know that if I move it into drive, it's gonna move forward. You know how the brake works. So why does the Benz cost more than the Camry, right? They, they both do the same thing. They both serve the same function, and yet there's, there's certain nuances and features and bells and whistles 
in that Benz that don't exist in the Camry, and somewhere somebody explained the expectations around the features in each of those vehicles. That's the piece that rarely happens with the work that we do. So one of the things that we try to impress upon people is the need to establish expectations in clear language. So humans and their feelings drive project outcomes. And that's like the saddest thing to share with a group of technologists. Because you guys are all nerds and you want data to decide how people react to the work that you do. And the reality is emotions actually actually drive project outcomes more than anything. And I'm talking about your relationship and the perception of success with your client when the work is delivered. I'm not talking about how we measure success against the goals that we establish, so let's be clear. But let's think about um, Apple, for instance. How many of you are on Macs? Lots of you, lots of you. How many of you have iPhones? Um, and will you ever get anything else? Those of you on Macs, will you ever be anything but a Mac lover? Yes? Good for you. I think, you know, Apple's an interesting thing because it created an emotional connection with end users. It created products that we don't just want to own, we want to lick. I mean, let's face it. That's like, you know, and we have an emotional response to that stuff. And it's because of how they talk about what they do, how they set expectations for the products that we buy. And it's, for me, it's also because I don't have to explain the blue screen to my mother quite frankly. And when you think about that, how they simplified language and they simplified expectations and they created a whole world of users that will never ever stray because they believe that Apple does thinking for them, it's kind of remarkable. And yet we still sort of walk around in these very, very muddy waters. So we like to say that apathy is the enemy of awesome. And the reason we say that is because in order for projects to work, you have to care. And you have to have something, some, a, some sort of agreed on language or a way of communicating with your client that makes sense to everybody. And you have to be open to real and true collaboration. And I think, you know, years ago, it was sort of the standard where when people were executing projects, we would hire a contractor or we would hire a team and they would go off into their little hovels and they would do the work that they were doing and then they would deliver pieces of it to us and we would try to make sense of it. And oftentimes, those people on the layman side of the equation took what they got. They took what they got because they didn't know they didn't know how to push back if expectations weren't met. Now I think that process has sort of created a situation where we're better at articulating what we believe we are building, but we still have projects go off the rails because we aren't really true collaborators. We don't know how to truly collaborate. So learning how to talk about what you do is really, really important, but you're not talking to you. You're not talking to each other. And I think that's where messages get lost. Learning how to talk about what you do to people who have no idea what you're talking about is critical. And I know, you know, it's interesting because as I was coming out here, I was, Megan went to a wedding and I called her and I was like, I can't believe I'm going to San Jose to have this conversation. Because, you know, you guys must go to coffee shops and have conversations. I know you're from elsewhere too. But like seriously, in this market, don't you imagine everybody just strikes up conversations about tech like it's nothing? And yet we see it all the time. The people that are making decisions, business folks on the buy side of the equation are in a really tough spot because they are making, they are making job threatening decisions. They are spending massive budgets. They are extending whole businesses to the web. The other thing that we're seeing a lot of, and tell me if you're in this position, oftentimes it used to be that a business analyst was the person that would sort of translate business requirements to technology requirements. Remember that job? And now we don't see so much of that anymore. Now it's your job, actually. Now, and I always say that it's fascinating to me that clients expect people in our industry to oddly know everything. 
Everything there is to know about business, they want us to know. And what we need them to do is be more open to having conversations that dig deep and uncover those things that we never ever thought were relevant to the conversations that we have in driving requirements and project plans. And in order to do that, we have to give them room to be vulnerable. And we have to ask the tough questions. I say all the time, like 90% of my job is crushing people's dreams, destroying them, seriously, because that's the other thing that happens. They think that if they've, you know, and they're spending good amounts of money. So they think, well, anything can happen. That's a, that's a lot of money. I should be, it should be the Mercedes Benz of web apps. Yes, it should, but it's gonna be more money than that. And learning how to say no and driving a solution focused no is actually a skill that it takes, a, because think about it too, we're sort of in the sales business. You have to sell yourself, you have to sell your team, you have to sell your organization, whether it's internal or external, we're in the sales business. What do they teach you in sales? Never say no, never say no, and yet, and yet we're in a position where we sort of have to because somewhere in there we have to meet in the middle right around reality so that we understand what we're building for people and it goes against everything we ever learned from a service perspective service means you say yes all the time you do what you're told you get it done on time on budget period except we work in a world where i don't know many projects that happen like that i really don't how, when was the last time you worked on a project that didn't have a single change order? That where there wasn't one of those realizations somewhere three quarters of the way down the road where you were like, oh my God, you wanted what? I just had one the other day and I wrote a book about process for God's sake. So let's talk about why it happens. Again, I'm using sweeping generalizations. This is some data from an event apart survey. Um, but your typical developer, and I love, I love that this isn't entirely true anymore. This was uh, like two years old. But uh, your typical developer is male between, between 19, right? I see you looking around. I see you looking around, right? I, I totally, hey, I love it. I want to hug all of you. Um, but, the, but the reality is these numbers still apply, unfortunately. Um, I mean, I love men. Uh, 19 and 29, white, college educated, and doing their job for three years or less. Let's go back to thinking about the idea that we're asking these people to know everything there is to know about business. Um, the typical user of web apps is female, between 35 and 54, white, with a high school education. Fascinating. So, really, what we're talking about is two people that don't really speak the same language or understand each other. And I think, you know, the thing that I find often too is we do a lot of work with marketing departments, communication departments, and the woman on the left is actually Megan's mother, and she works inside of one of the largest agencies in Minneapolis and she's a decision maker there. So she represents a lot of things, none of them being those two tiny donkeys. I don't know what's going on there, actually. Um, but you know, we see this, and we think nothing of it, and yet, you know, how many of you remember 15 years ago when most decisions that were made on the web happened from the back end first? So we programmed something and then we made it look like something, or we designed something, we programmed it, we slapped those two things together and we hoped to God that we were addressing user goals. And now we're smarter about how we deal with user goals, except we still don't really know how to communicate with the people that make the decisions. So we like, one of the tips that we like to share with everybody is don't drop truth bombs. Do you know what a truth bomb is? I mean, this is just one example of ways in which communication falls down. To you guys, a bug is a part of life. To the people that buy the stuff that we do, a bug is a mistake and or a disaster and or a screw up on your part. So it's stuff that's as simple as that. I mean, one of the things that we, when we do this on client side, yesterday it was a group of marketers. One of the things that I try to tell them is bugs are a part of what you're doing. When we launch something, it's not the end, it's a beginning. And you're never done. You are now in the software business. That's what we're telling them. But on this side of it, 
what we try to encourage people to recognize is that bugs are something these people aren't familiar with. Remember what I said earlier about how advertising has sort of dictated the process for how decisions are made around the work that we do? Let's think about that for a second. Advertising, broadcast, print, everything that launches in that world is done. It's final. It will never be anything other than what it is on the day that it launches. Everything that launches in our world is breathing and evolving and never done. And hopefully we're collecting the right data to make the right decisions about what it should be through that evolution. Hopefully we've thought about scalability. Hopefully that's the kind of conversation we're trying to encourage clients to have. But when they come to us with a solution, they walk through the door and they say, I need a Facebook app, I need a website, I need this thing. And they believe that when they have that thing, they are done. They are done. And if that thing isn't working the way they expected it to, you guys take the rap. And the reason is we are afraid to have the conversations we have to have to avoid that kind of confusion. Those conversations require us to say no. They require us to tell the truth. They require us to be very, very candid in a, in a, in a dynamic that doesn't necessarily allow for that. And if you're brought in as a contractor, or you're brought in as an outside team, or, you're, or you come in the door with a, an account person, I mean, how many of you work with account people? Anybody? Have you ever met an account person that was worth anything? In your lives, have you? Have you? No? See? It's the craziest thing. That job doesn't go away, but they create this, this wild thing that happens. Account people, basically facilitate the most complicated, involved game of telephone any of us will ever play, right? They are the guys. So this is, there's a guy or a, or a woman, and it's, more, it's women a lot, um, who has no idea about what the hell we're doing, but they get to define requirements with the client, translate that to us, tell us what to do, right? And then they get frustrated when they don't get it back. And they never want to say no to a client, ever. And so one of the things that we try to impress in our book is, this is the conversation that needs to start with leadership. I mean, project management isn't just something that happens with a person that we call project manager. It's something that happens team-wide. Regardless of whether or not you're inside or outside of an organization, it happens throughout. And leadership has got to endorse this kind of thinking in order for us to be more successful in the projects that we initiate and deploy, period. Except this is the last conversation they're going to have. And it's sort of tragic because they're used to doing things the way they've always been done. Except we can't do that anymore because we win. We're the winners. We're driving business now. And in order for us to drive business right, we have to encourage those sorts of candid, uncomfortable conversations that are not about how advertising has always been. They're about how digital must work in order to be successful. So remember that truth bombs, while they're a part of life for us, and we're used to talking about things in a really, in a really candid, direct way, Bugs are not something that clients generally know how to deal with. So the first thing that I always think is important to remind people of is surprises are only good at birthday parties. And even then, they're not that thrilling. Um, so this is our process. And it's unique to the work that we do. And it doesn't have to be your process, but you need one. And regardless of how you work in the context of your project team, regardless of who you are, if you're a contractor, if you're an inside dev, whatever the case, you need to encourage a process. You need to encourage that it be written down. And I like to give this thing to clients. And here's why. This is a you are here, that's sort of a you are here kind of map in the, in the process. So if they have that, and they've been given whatever document, they know where they are. And here's the thing, we all know about waterfall, and we all know about agile, except they don't work when we're dealing with agencies. They're ideal, 
That would be a lovely way to work. Agile is great, except clients don't love it, because Agile is one of those things that's like, well, we're going to work, and then we're going to deliver something, and then we're going to work a little, and then we're going to deliver something. Are you with us? And they're like, well, that sounds like a lot of money. And Waterfall is great, except we're going to do it this way, and then we're going to deliver this, and then we're going to do it absolutely this way, and then we're going to deliver this. And clients are like, well, that seems a little too rigid. That seems like a little too much for me to have to fall inside. So we, we do this. This is the process that we've outlined. And it's really meant for rapid, rapid planning and production of any project. And the thing that I think is sort of interesting about this is, I want to see, yeah, is we split our process into two parts. And here's the thing that we, we have these manifestos in the beginning of our book. And I encourage you to take, if you do nothing else, take this part of this discussion out into the world and preach the good word to whomever you can influence. Please, please. You cannot define scope in a proposal. You cannot. Clients need to stop asking for it. Agencies need to stop trying to do it. And we need to stop participating in that process. That is the biggest downfall of the work that we do right there. Trying to say, yep, we're absolutely doing this. It's absolutely going to cost this, and you could expect it here. That is not the way this work works. It will never work that way. Expectations that are established in proposals are the bane of our existence. Let's all admit it. How many times have you, I mean, how many of you are contractors? OK. So when you have, so it's OK. You can ballpark sort of. But when you've got like an account person who has come to you with vague requirements, who, who gets the short end of that stick? And I think, honestly, defining requirements collaboratively with the client who knows their business better than the account person or you ever will is the best way to approach that work. So we encourage clients to pay us a flat fee for the planning part of the work that we do. And in that process, in that planning portion of the work, we don't just deliver a requirements document. We actually get very, very feature specific with the client so that they understand what we're doing. We deliver a requirements document, but we also deliver what we call a development approach. And the development approach is our development plan, if you will. And that plan is the thing that articulates not only what the features are that we've agreed to, but how we're going to get to them. There's other documents in here, and you're welcome to take a look at this. And the slides will be available, and you can download this whole process document. But I want to tell you about the most miraculous document in our process that clients like cry over. It's the weirdest thing. And if you have influence over process, I encourage you to think about this one the management plan. I'm telling you, clients pass out when we, when we deliver this document. It's the first thing we bring, and it's the thing that clarifies so much right out of the gate. The management plan is where we outline, who's the project team? What are their roles? Think about it. It very rarely gets communicated to clients. And yet, every single one of you matters in the context of project work. The management plan also outlines Who's on the internal team? Who's on the client side? Who's responsible for approvals and decisions? How will those get made? The one thing we insist upon always is a single point of contact and a single point for filtering approvals. Because that game of telephone gets worse and worse the more you allow it. And that is a problem when expectations. And I mean, how often have you had this happen, where you've delivered a product, and you've gone all the way through deployment, and somebody at the C level finally gets to look at it, and it's not what they had in mind. Does that make you want to rip your teeth out? Because it does for me. And that's what we try to avoid. They are signing off on a process that they agree to, and no CEO is going to be able to put the kibosh on our work long after it's done and delivered, not without paying for it. That's what saves us there. So the management plan also outlines risks. Very important, something most people aren't thinking about, especially when they've just fallen in love with their project team on the agency side. The first thing we deliver are what we believe are potential risks. What are the risks? Well, if the agency or the client or the 
you know, whatever, doesn't deliver on their approvals and turnaround times, it will impact their timeline. And we spell it out very, very clearly for them. We tell them that if, if we say you have three days to turn this around internally and you don't, this is what it means to your timeline. And we don't pull any punches there. And honestly, clients get so thrilled at being a part of the team and being respected as technology brains in the process that they deal with that really well. Except this is stuff that we don't talk about because in this sort of sales culture that we have and the agency culture, nobody wants to say no. So we don't say, well, I'm sorry. Instead, we make people work all night to deliver against a deadline that we promised that the client put in jeopardy. Well, we can't do that forever. I mean, we, that's, not a, that's no way to live, right? So we insist that we don't do it. So don't define scope in a proposal. Don't participate in the process if you're asked to do it. That's the, that's the only way we're gonna change behavior, right? A good process has to balance rigor and agility. I think when people hear process, especially on the client side, what they hear is, oh, that sounds, that sounds, that sounds like you're gonna hold us you know, like your expectations of us are too rigid. And we like to say no, what we're really trying to do is clarify expectations. And what we really want to do is over communicate versus under communicate. And these are the pieces, so, and that is the cost of change that clients never think about. But when you make it about a business decision, so when we talked about the CEO who comes in and puts the kibosh on something because it doesn't work the way he expected it to, or she expected it to. Oftentimes, if you can very clearly illustrate why it's important for them to be involved in thinking about it early in the process, they think differently. When it's a business decision, when it impacts dollars, when it, when it speaks to budget, they, they hear you. So here, we just, with this very simple little illustration, we show our clients exactly why it costs more to make changes later in the process than it would earlier. It's a lot easier to make a change in a Word document than it would be to change code, to rewrite a feature. Very different. Clients hear that. And I'm happy to estimate the four minutes that it takes me to change a Word document versus you know, the 40 hours it's going to take me to code something again. So I think this is actually a, this is a, Actually, oh no, that is ours. You can steal that. So we like to say that humanity is innovation. I'm actually gonna go back to this process slide. Humanity is innovation. And we say that because at every stage of this process, we engage with our clients in a new and different way. One of the things that our clients are also always sort of bowled over by is what we call the email alias. So I mentioned earlier that culture plays a big part in how our clients work and how they understand work and how they facilitate process. One of the things that I also want to remind you of is culture on our side of it also matters and how we work. So we have these hiring standards and we agree that we will never hire a human being who is not capable of sitting across the table from a client. And in fact, they should and they deserve to be in the rooms when we're having conversations about project requirements. So we have this thing called an email alias. And I know you guys are all like, hi, welcome to 1992. We have this thing called an email alias and it blows clients' minds. And in fact, we've been doing talks like this for project management groups inside of agencies for the last year. And when we talk about the email alias, it's the one thing that it, and it's really tactical, which is why I don't have a slide for it, but it's the one thing that they all go, whoa, that never occurred to me. Here's what we do. So there's always those single points of contact that create issues for the rest of us. And if we were able to get unfiltered conversations straight to our inboxes, it would probably enlighten us a lot as to the kinds of conversations that are occurring about the project work. So we put the entire team on an internal alias and an external alias so that every single conversation that the client has that's relative to the project is visible to everybody on the project team. Now when we tell clients about it, oftentimes they're like, oh my God, I already get so much email, really? 
But they help us define, and we outline in that management plan, who on the project team should have access to these conversations. And then we tell them, you don't have to read them all. But when you need sort of this living history of conversation, it's available to you. And now I know you're thinking, well, why not Basecamp? There's all sorts of project management tools out there that make these things available to us. Do you know what they have that we don't want? Another login screen. We're trying to eliminate all the barriers for entry. Remember, we're talking about people that are already overwhelmed by technology. They're already surrounded by people inside of their organizations that are having these kinds of conversations all the time. And they don't want to say, actually, one more piece of software is really off-putting. So an email alias is this convention. Email is a convention that they're used to, that they're already checking every day. And if they have access to that content, and it's really easy and it's fileable, they'll use it. And internal is all of the internal conversations from the internal team. So if you see something and it's a flag, you can respond to it immediately. If your project manager get hit, gets hit by a bus, you can step in and take part in that critical conversation so that the project doesn't go off the rails. And you're not using another tool. When we interview project managers, one of the things that I ask them every single time is, what do you need to do your job? And if they say Microsoft Project, we're done. Because what I want them to say is this and a pencil. That's it. Because a process, no matter how good it is, is no substitute for thinking. And we have gotten to that place in business where we have this expectation that there is software that serves as a good substitute for thinking, and there is process that serves as a good substitute for thinking. And what I don't know, well, he knows. He'll be the person. How many times do you sit in those meetings where you're defining requirements and people defer because they don't want to be the guy that says the wrong thing? because most people have no idea what in the hell we're talking about. That's why. So I'm going to close this whole discussion, because I know I'm sort of at the, at the end of my time. I'm going to close this whole discussion by encouraging you to adopt a process, but don't make it a replacement for thinking. You're welcome to ours. It works. We've used it for massive projects and short-term promotions that we turn around in very short order for very big brands that have a lot of risk. It works very, very well for us. But remember that having difficult conversations, encouraging true collaboration, transparency, real transparency, not that overhyped word we read about in the Harvard Business Review, but real transparency is critical to getting this work done. And you guys showing up at the table and being willing to have the tough conversations is more critical than anything, because what you do is a mystery to the people that pay for it. So thank you very much.